Hello to everybody out there in Periscope land. This is Brother Ed, and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, and uh, we're going to try to do a Romans overview, kind of a little bit late here at night. Uh, if I'm correct, we are on a part 27 to this series. We are on a part 27 to this series. All right, guys, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, just kind of touch up from the beginning, and we're going to work ourselves down to where I think we supposedly left off. And uh, what we're going to try to do, guys, is kind of zoom in on some things and kind of uh, get an understanding, an overview understanding of uh, this chapter 7 that we're on. And uh, let's go ahead and give it a start. All right, let's start with verse 1 here, and we'll work ourselves down. Um, Romans 7, 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more adulterous, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Verse 8, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. All right, we'll start here in verse 8, my friend, and what we'll do is we'll kind of try to make some comments on these things so we, get an, so we can get an understanding on these things. So um, what is concupiscence? If you look at this word right here, it's a, that's a pretty big word, concupiscence. Well, um, what I have here is uh, uh, just uh, some commentaries I have made on Romans 7, 8. Now, this is a good New Testament word meaning unlawful or irregular desire of carnal pleasure. It is a synonym, a synonym of lust. That's what concupiscence is. One would expect a degenerate society to glorify lust and immorality and make a god of Cupid. See, concupiscence. They would make a god of Cupid. What, what one would not expect to find churches holding banquets and parties on St. Valentine's Day to glorify such concupiscence. Hey, how's it going there, Cougar? So here we have our word concupiscence. Now we saw that it is synonymous with lust, okay? It's an irregular desire of carnal pleasure, okay? But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. You see what sin did? Here we have Paul the Apostle, the one that's talking, who was found blameless. He was found blameless keeping the law. And yet, in Romans 7, 8, a saved man says, this law, this, this, these commandments wrought in me, that's Paul talking, all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. See, if you don't know the law, then sin really has no force upon you. 
Because you don't really know the letter of the law. You don't know specifically what sins that you violated. But when you have the letter of the law, all of a sudden it becomes more clear the violations that you've had concerning the law. Now, we're not just talking about any law, although this does apply, um, you know, practically, even if you go to a court of law. I mean, most people go to court and they don't really know the laws, you know, that are in the law books. And then when they go to court, they get kind of slammed with laws that they never even heard of. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. I violated that. And then by violating that, I violated that. And by violating that, I violated that. And it works the same way. But in, with God, it, if you're saved today and you're learning the Bible, then what, what learning the Bible will do is show you how much of a sinner you really are in which you can glory in the grace of God that you've only received through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not saved today and you're on my scope, I would uh, urge you today, you would consider what Jesus Christ has did on the cross for your sins. Time is running out. Death is sure. Death is coming for all of us. You need to be prepared to meet God. And in order to be prepared, um, you need to make sure that you know that you've trusted in what you know to be true. And that's what I mentioned, that you know there's a God. That's step one. Number two, you need to respond to that one true God by the faith that God has dealt with every man. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Now, if God dealt with you if God dealt with every man a measure of faith, then you need to take the faith that God's given you and not put it in science. Don't put it in, in evolution. You need to put it, put that faith that God's given you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody has faith in something, guys. And God says he's, he's entrusting you with knowledge and with truth. And will you respond to what you know to be true and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Okay, so believe that he died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. And if you trust that and believe on that, not, not Brother Ed, not some man, not some prophet, but the Holy Bible, the Word of God says that you're saved. Not just till the next time you sin. Not just till the next time um, you feel like you've lost your salvation. The Bible says the moment you have you have a one moment in time where you have believed and trusted in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are saved forever. Forever. I mean, what is eternal life? Is eternal life temporal or is eternal life eternal? So if eternal life is eternal, then there's no way you can lose it once you've obtained it. So that's very important that you know that because so many people are taught that when you're saved, you've got to keep it. And you can't keep your own salvation because we mess up every day. So we need to trust in Jesus Christ and that he keeps our salvation for us. God keeps our salvation for us. Praise the Lord for that. I couldn't trust my, my own self with obeying God and every statute that he's told me to obey. How, how am I going to be able to keep my own salvation? I couldn't do it. Therefore, I trust in the one true God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to keep my salvation for me. And you do the same. All right, guys, now I got that little gospel message, um, you know, out of the way. Let's continue on. So let's go to verse nine. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. You see that? Here's Paul talking. This is what the commandments do to us. When we learn these commandments, we learn that, wait a minute, I, I, I didn't keep that law. Wait a minute, I didn't do that. Wait a minute, I didn't do and this law over here in the New Testament. No, I didn't do that. Wait a minute, this one over here, I didn't do that. And, and even more so, Paul being a Jew, he had a whole lot more to keep of the letter of the law, and the law was given to the Jews anyway. So we're talking about the letter of the law was given to the Jews. And see, Paul couldn't keep it. He realized, wait a minute, I've, I'm blameless according to the law, but yet when I go into the law, I see, wait a minute, sin is reviving and I died. I can't keep it because if I violate but one law, I'm guilty of all. James chapter 2, verse 10. See, Paul knew he couldn't keep it. 
That's why it says blameless. It doesn't say sinless, according to Paul's testimony. You see that? That's why words do matter, okay? For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now look at verse 10. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Do you guys see that? Now, what does ordained mean? Because see, you always get a problem with these people that want to redefine words and they don't redefine or they don't define the words in their context. They'll define the words and what they think in their heart or what they think society would define these words as. Okay, so what we're going to do, guys, we're going to, this is a novel idea. We're going to look to see what the Bible, how the Bible defines ordained. Okay, let's do this. Psalms 713. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Now, do you guys see the word prepared there? Let's go ahead and highlight that. Now, look what it says. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. Now, see the semicolon right there? We're about to redefine, or not redefine, we're about to define what, where's our word, ordaineth means. He hath also prepared for him instruments of death. Now, what do you mean by that? He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Well, here we go. There's your definition right there. Let's highlight that one. So ordaineth means what? Prepared. And if I said prepared, what does that mean? Ordaineth. Not hard, guys. Let's do it again. Isaiah 30, 33. For Tophet is ordained of old. So let's highlight ordained there. You guys do the same in your Bible. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is what? Prepared. Now let's highlight that. Now, as you see the semicolon there? We are, we are doing a definition of ordained here. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. Now, where, where does it say, for Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king, it is predestined? It doesn't say that. So why would somebody say that ordained means predestined when all in the Bible it says ordained means prepared? Let's do it again. Romans chapter 7, verse 10, and that, that was our other one. We'll come back to that. I, I definitely, that, that's where our verse is right there. We're going to come back to that. Let's do this one. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should what? Live the gospel. Now, you see, ordained in the context of 1 Corinthians 9, 14 is even so hath the Lord, now look, prepared that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So when you take that word ordained and you know what it means, we still use the word ordained because the King James Bible is perfect and preserved. And so we, we say ordained, but when we define the word ordained, we mean prepared. So let's not get that confused, okay? Um, and that's what Calvinists will do. They'll, they'll say ordained always means from the foundations of the world, uh, predestined. And that's not what ordained means. It means prepared. Okay, well, that, that puts a monkey wrench in a lot of people's false doctrine, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Now, let's go to another one. Let's do Ephesians 2.10. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, now this is the good works we're talking about. And what is God doing right there? God hath before ordained. That means he's prepared for anybody that's in Christ and they're saved unto good works. They are prepared. God has told them before that they are prepared that they should walk in them. 
That's what getting saved should prepare you to do, is to walk in good works. That's, this isn't from the foundation of the world, okay? We're talking about a preparing. God says we are prepared to walk in good works. That is our context right here. See it? I got to highlight it right there. Good works. Now, let's do another one. Actually, this will be our final one right here. We'll just go back to Romans 7.10. And what we'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll refute some Calvinism here as we do this. Now, look what it says. And the commandment which was ordained to life. Now, if ordained means predestined, okay? If ordained means predestined, then guess what? He's saying, I found to be unto death. So wait a minute. So what's ordained to life is really ordained to death. That means God has ordained the commandment to be to death. So from the foundations of the world, God ordained all of us to die. Now, if you take the Calvinistic road, you take the Augustinian road, this is where it's going to lead you. It's going to lead you to fallacy of all kinds of scriptures and contradictions all over the place. But if you define the Bible with the Bible, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, what you'll find is a more complete understanding and no contradictions. And when you understand Romans 7.10, guess what you understand? And the commandment which was ordained, which means prepared to life, I found to be unto death. Prepared to life. You know what? None of us can keep the commandments to earn eternal life. So what does it prepare us for? It prepares us for death. Why? Because none of us can keep the law. So what do we need to look to? We need to look to somebody that has kept all the laws. Every single law didn't violate one single law his whole life long. And who was the only person that was ever to keep every single law? That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, see guys, now that's the comparison that Paul is doing right here. He's comparing what he has done according to works in the law, according to the law itself, that it cannot be violated at all. That's what he's comparing it to. And none of us can keep every single law. And the problem is, if you started keeping all the law, what are you going to do about the laws that you haven't kept? And that's the problem. It isn't what you're keeping right now. It's what it's if you've been keeping it your whole life long. And if you violated the law one time in your life, even when you didn't know any better, you're still guilty. And that's the problem. And Paul is posing that problem right here in Romans 7. He's saying none of us can keep it. Because if we can, what do we find? We find that all, all the times when we weren't keeping it, we're still guilty. That's the point. Okay? So, let's not get confused on this word ordained. It means prepared. And look, I found to be unto death. Let's understand that when we try to measure our lives with the law and we just need to be good people to go to a better place, we find that we can't do it. We found it to be unto death. To death. We all deserve to die when we compare our lives with the law to being good people, you know, being nice people, okay? <laughs> I found to be unto death, okay? That's, that's what you're left with. Now look at verse uh, 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So what, what do we have going on with sin? We have, we have a deception going on with sin. And you know what sin will do? It'll deceive you into thinking, well, I have fun for a season. I, I, I have this fun and, and there's nothing wrong. I'm not hurting anybody. And all the while, you're being deceived. You know what Titus 3.3 3 says? Look what it says. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived. You see the word deceived there? That was us. This is when we were still lost. This is 
save people when we were still lost. This is our testimony. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So you see that, guys? Deceived. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures. That used to be us when we were lost and undone. Come on, guys. It's only trusting Jesus and that's it. It's not Jesus plus any good works. It's not Jesus plus going to church. It's not Jesus plus sacraments or baptism or any, anything you can put under the sun. Guys, it's Jesus Christ alone. And if I never step foot in a church ever in my life, I am saved according to my trust in that Christ died for my sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. That's important. But I was deceived at one time. I was serving diverse lusts and pleasures, and I, I was deceiving myself into thinking that there was nothing wrong with those things. I was, I was, I was thinking to myself, well, if I, if I do a little bit of good in my life, then that'll kind of weigh out the, the wickedness in my life, and that's self-deception. I was deceiving myself, and guys, if you're living that life today, you're deceiving yourselves. That's all you're doing. Let's hit another one, 2 Timothy 3.13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now look, look, look. Deceiving and being deceived. And then look at the next verse. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, now look, guys. This is Paul talking to Timothy here. But, but look, look what's going on. He's telling Timothy, look, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. Now, you know what? You know, what it, you know, you could have an evil man in a church. You know that? It's possible to have an evil man in a church. Do you know you could have a saved person to turn his back on the Lord Jesus Christ and become an evil man? You, he could become a seducer. He could wax worse and worse, deceiving and him and himself being deceived. That's possible. We're warning people in the church, there's wolves in sheep's clothing, and there's also sheep that are becoming wolves. Guys, you got to be careful. You've got to measure everything by the word of God. Don't measure things by some man-made doctrine. Don't measure anything by some man-made book. You, gotta, you guys got to go by the word of God and measure everything by this word of God, that holy King James Bible. Okay, let's do another one. 1 Timothy 2.14. Let's go back. Let's get some context. Look at verse 10 up here. Now, now let, let's go back even further. Let's start with a paragraph mark. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, what's modest apparel? That's something that's not skimpy. What's modest apparel? That's something that doesn't reveal things on a woman. What's modest apparel? That's not running around in Daisy Dukes and short miniskirts. That's not showing off all your tattoos that which are violating scripture anyways. If you're a Christian, you don't need to be getting any tattoos. Guys, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with what? With what? Military, military facedness. Nope. Man equal to womanness. Wo womanness. Nope. Guys, with shamefacedness. And what? Drunkenness. Nope. Does that say drunkenness there? Nope. Does it say mo moderate drinking? Nope. And sobriety. Not with broided hair or gold, or pearls, or costly array. Hey, that would be pretty modest if she didn't do all that, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Look at verse 10. But, but what? Which becometh women 
professing godliness. Not women professing, you know, their independence. Not women professing, you know, their aggressiveness and their, their willingness to be better than a man. No, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about godliness. Women professing godliness with good works. You see that? Nowhere in, nowhere in here does it say that you need to be better than a man. Nowhere in here does it say that a man is better than a woman. Let's get it straight before everybody starts calling me some kind of a bigot, okay? Because God has placed the laws of submission upon man and woman and child, okay? Let's keep going. Look at verse 11. Let the woman learn in what? Silence. No, that's not for only the, the people that were in the church back in those days. You guys need to stop stop shredding up the scriptures. Stop trying to apply only what you feel like you want to apply to the scriptures and only apply what you want. Guys, you've got to obey the scriptures. When they're written to the New Testament church, you obey them. You don't say, well, I don't think that's going to apply to us. Because I find it socially inconvenient. I find it, you know, in a society, it's unacceptable. You know, you know what you are? You're a compromiser. That's what you are. Because you don't believe the Word of God. And you'll walk around telling everybody you believe the Bible as you violate scriptures left and right. Shame on you. Shame on you. This stuff needs to be said. Let the woman learn in silence. What does that mean? It means when she's learning, she needs to be silent. She needs to stop talking. You need, to stop, you need to stop teaching people. What, what are women doing teaching men? No. It has nothing to do with a man being better than a woman, woman better than a man. It has something to do with what God said. Let the woman learn in silence with all what? Subjection. What does that mean? Let the woman learn in all silence with all boxing gloves on and boxing you down till you break your jaw? No. Subjection means submit. Do you know how to submit? When you go to a job, do you submit to your boss even when you're a woman? And, and if you're a woman and you don't submit to your male boss, what does he do? He fires you. So women know how to submit. Why can't you submit? That's the problem. Because of a rebellious heart, rebellious attitude. Because people don't want to obey God. They'd rather obey man. Let's do it again. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. Now, that's pretty crystal clear. I shouldn't even have to even comment on that. But you'd be surprised how many people avoid 1 Timothy 2.12. Now, you're like, what does this got to do with what we're talking about? It's got everything to do with what we're talking about, okay? We need to understand the context so we can understand what it means to be deceived, right? So, let's keep going. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Wow. The Bible said it twice. Right here, learn in silence. Look but to be in silence. Now, what in being silent does a woman not understand? You say you're picking on women right now. I pick on the men too. But right now we're talking about this. And, and this is the Bible. We don't skip verses in the Bible, do we? No, we don't. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. You see that? And Adam was not deceived. So there's the man. He was not deceived. But look at this. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So who was the one deceived? The woman. Who was the one that was talking and, and rambling about with her mouth to the serpent and saying, you know, you know, we can't eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Who was the one blabbing her mouth and saying things that God didn't even say? That was the woman. The woman was doing all that. So the woman was deceived, not the man. Adam knew what was going on. Adam willingly sinned. 
But the woman, she was deceived. She was deceived. One more time. She was deceived. So why is a woman not to teach? Because she was deceived. Why is a woman to be in silence? Because she was deceived. Why is a woman not to usurp authority over the man? Because she was deceived. Why is a woman to, to, to learn under a man and with, with all subjection? Because she was deceived. All right. You, you got to say this kind of stuff because people get confused. They say, well, you know, you don't preach 1 Timothy 2.14, do you? You don't preach... <laughs> you don't preach 1 Timothy 2.11, do you? Uh, yes, I just did. And we believe, we believe the Bible, okay? So, deception is a real phenomenon in a, hu in a human uh, being in how they encounter practical, coherent things in life. How they deal with reality. Uh, Self-deception is a very culpable phenomenon, okay? Um, there's people out there that are deceived and don't and really believe they're not deceived. Okay? So let now now here I want to cover this one too since we're on deception. We are told three times not to be deceived in the New Testament. Let's give a few. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. You guys see that? Be not deceived. Colon, neither what? Fornicators? Are you a fornicator? You watching that pornography right now? You a fornicator? Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, it says looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her or in his heart. So neither fornicators nor idolaters. You got your own little Jesus. You got your own little Jesus that says watching pornography is okay. You got your own little Jesus that says going out to the club and the bar and getting drunk is okay. You got your own little Jesus that says, gee, me and Jesus are cool. Me and Jesus, Jesus is my homeboy. You know, you know, Jesus saves me money at Walmart. Yeah, yeah, that's not the Jesus. You an idolater. You're an idolater. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. You married today? You try to find some excitement somewhere else? You better repent. You're deceived. And if you're thinking that you're going to inherit the kingdom of God being an adulterer, shame on you. Nor effeminate. Oh, you, oh you, you, you're wearing that rainbow shirt today? You got on that rainbow shirt? Got your rainbow umbrella on? Huh? You out in the rain with your rainbow clothes on? Talk about, I'm gay. And, you know, gay people are just as, as right with God as anybody else. See, there you go again. Nor feminine. Nor feminine. Now, that's clear. That's pretty crystal clear. Guys, you a homosexual? You gay? You better repent. Repent. Nor effeminate. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Oh, that, that could, abusers of themselves with mankind could cover a bulk of things that hum, uh, humans do on a daily basis. Abusers of themselves with mankind. You like watching horror movies? Abusers of themselves with mankind. This covers our pornography. Abusers of themselves with mankind. You like, come on guys, you like uh, watching sinful things? Um, no matter where you go, you like watching fights, you like watching uh, dirt and filth, uh, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves. Say, I'm not a thief. How dare you call me a thief? Ever downloaded anything from Pirate Bay? Ever downloaded anything from one of them torrent sites? Ever downloaded illegal music off YouTube? Guys, you ever download anything? You, you, you ever borrowed a pencil and not given it back? Ever, if you're a woman, ever borrowed a hairbrush and not given it back? Nor thieves, nor covetous. You say, well, I don't violate that one. Ever wanted somebody else's wife? Ever wanted somebody else's girlfriend? Ever wanted somebody, period? Nor covetous, nor drunkards. Well, I don't violate that one. Oh, you don't? You don't violate that one? No. Ever had a drink? One drink in your life? Nor drunkards. Well, I don't define drunkards that way. Well, see, you don't know what the Bible says then. 
If you're drinking, you're a drunkard. See? Oh, I don't like that. I think you're pushing that one too far. No, nor drunkards. We believe the Bible, nor drunkards. You want to drink? You're a drunkard. But I drink in moderation. You're a drunkard. You're not a moderate drunkard. You're a drunkard. <laughs> nor revilers. You a reviler today? Every time somebody tells you something, you revile it? Come on. I'm telling you about God. You revile that? I'm telling you about Jesus Christ. You revile that? I tell you about the Bible. I tell you about Christian conduct, Christian living. Do you revile that? Does it mess up your plans and what you want to do in your life when I mention sins in the Bible? Nor revilers, nor extortioners. You extorting things? Is that, what, is, that, is that how you make your money? You extort people? Is that how you have your way with your wife? Is, and wife, is that how you have your way with your husband? You extort them? Come on, is that how you make money? You make money prostituting and extorting? You better repent. Look, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you know, the whole time, the whole time we said this, what are we, what are we dealing with? People that are deceived. Are you deceived? Are you deceived? Because people think they can get away with all the things we mentioned and that they're going to have some kind of place with God. And you're not. You'll not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you. All you're going to have is death. That's where that leads you. Death. The wages of sin is death. All right, guys, I think we, okay, we, we did the first one, be not deceived. So we are told three times to be, not de to be not deceived. We did uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Now let's do 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Guess what? People are deceived in this thing. You know, you know, I always get people that walk around talking about their Christians and all they have is evil communications. All they have is foul words. All they have is wicked, wicked, immoral things to say. All they have is blasphemy for God. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You know, all the while people are giving evil communications, they're thinking they got good manners. They really, they, they're really deceiving themselves. That, that's why we say, be not deceived. Because all the while they're thinking they got good manners as there's blasphemy God. Oh, oh my God. I can't believe he said that. Uh, sir, don't use oh my God on my periscope. Oh, I, I didn't think I said anything wrong. I have good manners. I didn't say anything wrong. It's just a figure of speech. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Yes, you have corrupt your manners when you're using evil communications. You don't have any manners. How dare you walk around saying you have manners as you're blaspheming the king on high. You're blaspheming the king of glory. You're blaspheming the one true God that gave you life. And you would dare walk around and say that I have good manners? As you're saying, oh my God, oh my God, like, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. Oh, like, like, oh my God, like, oh my God, oh, I can't believe it. Oh my God, oh my God, oh, look, there's a hurricane coming. Oh, Hurricane Matthew's coming. Oh my God, oh my God. Really? You need to shut your mouth. The Bible says who mouths, whose mouths must be stopped. Your mouth must be stopped. So you say, we're shut up in the Bible right there in Titus, whose mouths must be stopped. You know, people blaspheme God so much, and then they walk around talking about, I got good manners. There's nothing wrong with my manners. Now look at verse 34, awake to righteousness, which means people that are, have evil communications have not awoken to righteousness. Now let, let's cover this again. People that have evil communications are doing what? They're sinning because it says, and sin not, in response to verse 33. 
for some have not the knowledge of God. So when you have this kind of evil communication, oh my God, oh my God, when you're saying stuff like that, yeah, right. For some have not the knowledge of God. And look, I speak this to your shame. What a shame for a, for a person to walk around saying, oh my God, all day long. Good Lord, good Lord, or for goodness sake, or Jesus, mother of Mary, or, or mother of, you know, all, I mean, list the one, because they're all blaspheming God, all of them. You say, good heavens, how's that blaspheming God? Well, who's the one that created the heavens? And, and we know they're good. That's our God. You're, you're blaspheming God when you say good heavens. See, we're not going to get into too deep into this, but what we're talking about is a self-deception here. People are deceived as they have evil communications. Is that you today? You got evil communications and you're walking around deceived thinking they're not evil communications and you're thinking you got good manners as you stand before somebody that believes the Bible as you're saying, oh my God, good Lord, oh, oh my word. No, no, don't do it. All that is, they're all fillers, and they're all fillers to blaspheme who? The one true God. Don't do it. Stay away from those words. Retrain your vocabulary, so be not deceived. Let's do another one. Galatians 6, 7. Here's our last one for be not deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. So people are deceived in thinking that God is mocked. There, there's a self-deception there. People think they're mocking God, and that's self-deception. Now, look what it says. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap that thing. Now, 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 let's go to verse 8, get some more context. For he that soweth to his flesh... You want to sow to that flesh? You want, you want more sin? You want more fornication? You want more drugs? shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now look, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Notice that sowing to the flesh, you're not reaping any everlasting life. So how are you deceiving yourself into thinking that as you're committing all these horrid sins against the Holy God, that somehow you're going to have life everlasting? You're deceiving yourself. And the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You will reap what you sow. You want to, you want to sow to that flesh? If you keep sowing to that flesh, that corruption is going to lead to the wages of sin, which is death. And I don't mean just of the body. I mean of the soul. If you don't get saved, if you're not saved today, that's what's going to happen to you. But if you're saved today, you better get out of that flesh, man. You need to repent of that. And you start sowing to the Spirit. Now, now here's the problem with the sowing and reaping thing. People think that the moment they get saved, all of a sudden, the consequences of sins that they've already committed are going to go away. They are not going to go away. The, cons the consequences of sin are coming your way. And you better hope that you're going to be able to stand when those consequences come if you're saved. Because they're coming, and you better be ready. Just because you're saved, the consequences of your sins ain't going away. It's kind of like a man saying, well, I committed murder, and I'm in jail now. And I'm on death row. And I just, I, you know, I, I read the Bible. I got saved. I believed in Jesus Christ. How come I, I'm still on death row? How come I'm still in prison? You know Why? Because you still have to suffer the wages of sin because of the sins you've committed. It doesn't matter if you're saved. God's not going to save you out of the, 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 sin, the, the consequences of sins you've already committed in this body of flesh. Although you're, you're forgiven of those sins in heaven, you're, reckoned, you're reconciled to God according to what Jesus Christ has did on the cross for your sins. You have eternal life, but in the body of flesh. You're going to reap corruption, man. That stuff's coming your way. And you better be ready when it comes. You better be prayed up. You better, you better stay and hold fast to the scriptures and hold on tight because you're going to suffer those consequences. And you need Jesus Christ to go through those consequences with you. 
And you need to stand according to that spirit that you have within you. Yes, uh, Holy Spirit ain't going to get you out of those things. You're going to suffer those things. And you better, you better take heed to the word of God. And what are we dealing with in Galatians 6, 7? Be not deceived. Don't deceive yourself. And you know what's going to happen? Many will hear a message like this and they'll, they'll continue to be deceived. And when bad things happen and their consequences come, they blame God because of their own sin and the consequences for those sins coming. What a shame. What a shame that it would have to be that way. But it is for many people. All right, guys. So here we are. We, we're back at Romans 7, 11, For sin taking occasion by the commandment, look, deceived me and by it slew me. So that's what sin does. We covered a little bit of that self-deception and us being deceived by our sin. And that's just, a like I said, we're just scratching the surface. We're just grazing Bible verses for these things to have some understanding of the verses in Romans, okay? So what we're going to do, guys, we're going to stop right here. Um, yeah, we only hit a few verses. We'll stop at Romans 7, 11. And uh, thank you guys for joining me. Uh, KJV Bible Scope. My name is Brother Ed. And again, um, I appreciate you guys um, joining me and looking at these verses and studying the Bible yourselves, knowing what to believe out of the Word of God. And may the Lord richly bless you and all those that are um, here with me through this uh, uh, storm, this Hurricane Matthew. Um, I'll, I'll be praying for you guys. I pray that, first of all, that you get saved trust in Jesus Christ because you never know what uh, the Hurricane Matthew would do. It could be in the path of a Christian and also in the path of a lost person. And just because it's in the path of a Christian doesn't make, you know, God of none effect because things do happen. And this world, we need to be ready. We need to be, we need to be with God and the only way to be with God is to stand on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by believing that he died for your sins, he was buried, and rose again the third day. All right, guys, trust that and believe on that before it's too late. Um, don't wait till you're on your deathbed, and most won't even get that opportunity. Most people die instantly. Trust in Jesus today. Don't wait another minute. I'll definitely be praying for those that are going through this hurricane, uh, lost and saved alike that um, those that are lost would be saved and those that are saved would um, look to God in the bad times and the good times. Okay, guys, may the Lord richly bless you. Y'all have a good evening.